And thank you again for coming this evening. My name is Susan Sandall. And on behalf of Gail Joseph and my colleagues at the National Center on Quality Teaching and Learning, I'm very happy to see you all tonight um, on this spring evening. And a special thanks to those of you who have come several times this spring um, to hear about um, a number of issues in early childhood education, early learning, and especially around science and mathematics. And tonight, once again, we're going to hear um, some things that I think that we can use in our teaching with young children in the area of mathematics, but I suspect in other areas as well. So I'm very happy tonight to introduce our speakers, Dr. Elham Kazami and Dr. Allison Hintz. And uh, let me tell you just a little bit about them. Elham is on faculty here at the University of Washington in Seattle. She is our Associate Dean of Professional Learning. She's an Associate Professor in Mathematics Education. And um, Elham does um, some really quite remarkable work that combines her interest in the highest quality possible teacher preparation with um, her interest in mathematics education and how is it that we can come to understand how children are thinking and learning about mathematics and how that can improve teacher preparation programs so that we can think seriously about improving outcomes for children. She spends a lot of time in schools. She spends a lot of time with teachers. And um, she's going to share some of those experiences with us this evening. And um, her colleague tonight, Allison, is um, an assistant professor in mathematics education up the road at the University of Washington in Bothell. And she was one of Elham's graduate students here at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, see, we have friends everywhere. And um, Allison also prepares teachers and prepares teachers in the area of um, mathematics education and does a lot of learning from um, the young children and a lot of learning from her students. And again, putting them together. And Allison and Elham have been working together with teachers and leaders and principals at Lake Ridge Elementary School in Renton. This is just one of their, uh, one of their projects. They're involved in a, a number of, of projects. And this one in Renton is to build a school-wide instructional system that supports children to excel in mathematics. I think that's a wonderful goal for all of us. And tonight, we get to be strong and joyful and a little bit interactive because they brought some things along. Did you notice that? OK, Elham and Allison. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, and thanks, Susan, for that fabulous introduction. We are excited to spend the next hour and a bit with you. And we're told not to go past this black line. So if I stop and feel like I'm going to bump into a wall, it's because I have strict, strict directions. Um, it's a little odd to me because I want to come to you, but I'm going to just hover over here. It's better for the um, people who might watch this on film. Um, but we are here to have a fabulous evening looking at children's thinking in mathematics and the role that caregivers, parents, uh, teachers, playmates um, can play in the lives of the, math math the young mathematical lives of children. So I just want to know, how many of you here are parents? or caregivers of young children? How many of you are teachers? How about leaders? And if you're teachers, you are leaders as well. Um, and how many of you are students hoping to become teachers one day? So fabulous. Thank you all for being here. Um, so mathematics, there it is, in black and white, right? And many of us think of mathematics as a very black and white discipline. And that can either be great, you can love mathematics for its black and whiteness, or you can hate it for its black and whiteness. And tonight, we want you to think about mathematics not just as a black and white discipline. It's, 
We most often associate mathematics and being good at mathematics as being fast and being accurate, but mathematics is so much more than that. Um, we want mathematics to open up worlds for young children, to see it in full color, and to think about mathematics not just about speed and accuracy, but to think about all the things that make mathematical work what it is, which is reasoning, modeling, strategizing, predicting, generalizing, and more. These ideas are front and center in the Common Core, um, and in particular in the way that uh, standards for mathematical practice have been expressed. If you read the paragraphs associated with any of these, they pack quite a punch. But what's important in them is that they're trying to identify what it means to do mathematics. And we want tonight to take you inside some of these practices to see that mathematics, first and foremost, is about making sense. You should know why you're, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that mathematical problems can be worked on for quite a long time. And even young children can work on problems that take days, months, to work on over and over and over again. Um, we want children to always, even from the very young age, to be able to explain what they're doing to justify their strategies, and certainly to attend to precision. Mathematics is a discipline that cares about language as well as answers, and precision matters in mathematics. And we look, especially when we are counting, when we're deconstructing space and composing space, we're looking for structure. And allowing that us to guide the generalizations that we make, the things that we can do repeatedly. So we will show you in some examples what this looks like. And we're going to foreground the work in number in mathematics, even though if you were here a couple weeks ago when Doug Clements spoke, he talked a lot about the work in geometry that's also important. But we just want to, because we can't cover it all in one hour, just take you inside the world of number, because it tends to be the bread and butter of um, the young elementary years. So um, the math practices are really important. And in the Common Core, what's important for us is that it helps us look at some key areas. And this is just one paragraph that describes the critical areas in mathematics. And the highlighted sections talk about the work in number that we'll take you inside a little bit tonight. So our work is really driven by children. And when I was a school teacher, I worked with a team uh, teaching third and fourth graders one year, eight, nine, and 10 year olds. And my colleague, whenever he introduced himself, said, I am taught by eight, nine, and 10 year olds, rather than I teach eight, nine, and 10 year olds. And I think about how important that is when you work with young children to remember that as much as we want to teach them, we really want to show them how much we care about their ideas, and that by, in Vivian Paley's words, when we show that curiosity and respect for their ideas, we help them learn that they are people with good ideas, right? We want all of the children that we work with to say, I must be somebody with good ideas. Who am I that the, ch that, um, that the teacher is listening to so well? Sorry, I'm not supposed to touch that microphone, bad. Um, I'm learning about these things. Um, we want all of our kids to believe that they are people with good ideas. So here is where the snap peas come in. We're going to put you in the driver's seat. You have some snap peas. And mathematics is about inventiveness. So here's my challenge to you. Take a few minutes, come up with a game that you could play with a young child using snap peas. Talk with the people around you. I'll give you a few minutes. You've got a bunch of snap peas. What's a math game you can play with them? Go for it. All right. We have a few ideas. Let's share them. Who invented a game they'd like to share with us using snap peas? We're going to bring you a microphone. So if I have five snap peas and she's not looking, and I'm going to cover some up, then she has to tell many. There's three on the table. She needs to tell me how many are under the cup. Oh. Two. Two. 
And you're going to ask her, how did you figure that out? How did you figure that out? Well, you have three right here, like this. And so to have five, you need four or five right there. OK, thank you. That's great. We'll call that the missing snap pea game. <laughs> missing snap peas. OK, who's got another one? Um, no, I was just saying, so like, to see, to guess how many seeds are inside. Mm. So then like, but then you can also do like smaller and larger depending on like, how do you think that the, the little one has less than the big one? Uh huh. Um, which one has more seeds? Yeah, which one has more seeds? Okay. Why do you think it? Oh, why do you think it has more seeds? <laughs> why do you think it has more? Uh -huh. Okay. So guess how many inside? Mm -hmm. Great, nice game. We have another one. I have a two-year-old, so this is pretty simple. But basically, just snap them all open and then, you know, put them in the cup and count how many is going in the cup. So pretty simple. <laughs> So get all the individual seeds out? Individual seeds. Just yes. how many seeds, right? Yep. Snap them all open, put them back in the cup. Oh, these are brilliant. Did any other people think of those same three games? Yes? Did you think of that? Yeah. You could take it to even higher levels by saying something like, OK, I have five peas, and if I break each one in half, how many do I put in the cup now? Oh, there's 10 pieces. So then you have fractions involved. How many pieces if I, yeah. if I break them all in? Yeah, so if I have half, half times five is how many pieces all together. Right, right. and how did you figure that out, right? All yeah. of these have a how did you figure that out? How did you figure that out? So um, my, um, our children are here, some of our children are here, and they really wanted to demonstrate a game. So, Roshan. <laughs> this is a version of uh, the how many are inside game, right? So before we'd eat them, we'd say, how many do you think are in here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. OK, wait, though, these, are the, these are the right ones. Now look. OK, how many are in here? Four. Four. What do you think? Six. Six. All right, let's see. And look, it's magically open. This is like the cooking shows where things are pre-done. Yeah, there's five. There's oh, four. there's four. How many are there? Do you see this tiny one right there? Whatever. But here's the cool thing about snap peas. If you actually, very carefully with long nails, open them up, they um, open in different configurations. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. So then you could talk about how do you know that there's five or there's four, right? How did you see those? Did you see them as three and two or four and one or two, two and one, right? Two, two and one. So that's our game. But thank you. You can go sit down. So we want you to develop some new eyes for mathematics tonight. And when you open up these snap peas, really interesting things happen, right? So just like you said, you could think about how many go inside. But they, they show up. They kind of split open in different arrangements. And you can think about equivalents. These are both four. How are they four? What are the different ways? How many different ways can you make four with snap peas? And is there something that you can do to one snap pea to make it look like the other? So how do you transform one to look like the other to show that they're equivalent? And just like you thought about with your two-year-old, right, you could take out all the peas, and you could just count the peas um, separately. But you might also think, well, if you put them back in their, pea, in their pea pods, can you put the same amount in each one? How many would go in each one if they all had the same amount? Would they? Would there be any leftovers? What would you do with the leftovers? So a very simple way, just like you thought of, to play with these snap peas that come out of sitting around with a bunch of kids at snack time, right? So we wanted to give you examples of mathematical conversations that you can have at play informally, and then what more formal converse conversations look like in the classroom. And obviously, I could actually take these images and use them in more formal instructional sequences, you just using the snap peas that um, I had for snack the other day. But let me take you inside a classroom. And this is um, a kindergarten classroom near the end of the school year last year. Um, we've, Allison and I have had the distinct pleasure of learning side by side with uh, teachers at Lake Ridge Elementary. And they have been gracious enough to 
um, allow us to do some videotaping to share their practices and their and the kids' ideas with the world. And these particular ones were beautifully videotaped um, and put up on the teaching channel. But I want you to think about those same ideas that you just expressed being worked on in the context of a formal lesson. Um, if you have used the investigations curriculum, you'll recognize this activity as quick images, but it really can um, can show up in any math curriculum. It's not really particular or peculiar to investigations. But let's just take a look at how kids are working on um, thinking about what composing a quantity and decomposing it through this activity of quick images. My name is Stephanie Latimer, and today's lesson is Quick Images with my kindergartners. Quick Images is a very fast activity to show different combinations of numbers. And today's lesson was working on combinations to eight. Today I have three images for you, and I'm gonna show them to you really quickly. You're gonna give me a thumb right here if you have an idea how many you saw, and then I might ask you how you saw it. Are you ready? Here we go. The first time I show one of the images, I usually do about three seconds. A lot of my kids will count, and I don't want them to really count. I want them to see groups. I'm looking for thumbs. JT? Eight. Eight. Looking for thumbs. Isaiah? Eight. Devin? Eight. Michelle? Eight. Cameron? Eight. Dariana? Eight. Okay, I'm hearing a lot of eights. I'm gonna show you again, and it's okay if you need to revise your answer or if you have the same answer. Are you ready? Okay, so one more time, here we go. One, two, three, four. I was showing images up on the screen from the document camera and that just was too much for them. Magnets on the 10 frame on a whiteboard. That was easiest for me. Courtney? Eight. Eight. Jaden. Eight. Mari. Seven. Seven. Laura Jean. Eight. Eight. Michelle. Eight. So you saw eight. Can you tell me how you saw eight? I'm gonna put it up again so you can see it. There's five on the top and three on the bottom. So you said there's five on the top and three on the bottom. Can someone tell me what Michelle just said? Courtney, what did Michelle just say? She said five on the top and three on the bottom. Five on the top and three on the bottom. Did anyone else see it that way? Can you do this if you saw five on the top and three on the bottom? Okay, we're gonna do another one. Are you ready for it? How can be eight? You're right, Cavell. Did you hear him? Yes. He said it's still gonna be eight. So now you know how many it is, right? Yeah. How many is it gonna be? Eight. It's gonna be eight. So I don't want to know anymore how many there are. I want to know how you see them. Are you ready? Okay. So you're not telling me how many anymore, you're telling me how you saw them. Caval, can you tell me how you saw them? I saw two on the bottom mm -hmm. and, um, and, um. The word subitize was used if you were here a couple weeks ago. It kind of set out giggles in the crowd, but subitizing means what you, your eye is probably doing right now when you look at that image. Um, you're probably not counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're either seeing four at a time or two at a time, um, several sets of two or several sets of four. And that's something that we naturally do. We can subitize two, three, four, up to six. It's sort of like what we're doing with when we um, roll die in, in games. Um, and what kids are doing by the teacher using this 10 frame is using the structure of making use of structure, that going back to the common core practice standards. They're trying to think about how the 10 frame, which puts things into rows of five, is helping them figure out how many there are some of them might notice that there's two missing from 10 to know that there's also eight, right? Or the four separate. Maybe the 10 frame is not the structure that they're using, but they're just thinking about the arrangement of four. But when we think about basic facts and basic skill knowledge, a lot of these activities where you're constantly thinking about combinations 
um, that make a certain number are helping you understand that um, four and four make eight, but six and two make eight, but five and three make eight, right? All those things that we want to have more at an automatic level, but it's through the counting things in snap peas as well as more formal activities like this that help provide that foundation. Um, and also kids being able to talk and share how they figured those things out. What is it that they see? So there is a kid that will say, I saw four and two and one and one, and another child who will say, I saw twos, and another child who will say, I saw four and four. Um, and all of those ways are legitimate. You're telling the kids that their ideas make sense, but you're also having them compare and think about equivalents. So the boy Cavell, who says it's still going to be eight, he's kind of onto the teacher's game. But instead of, of her saying, oh, you know, here you are calling out again, she's uh, verifying to him that that's right. You've kind of figured this out. So I don't really want to know that it's eight. I want to know how you know that it's eight. And of course, in various versions of this, she's not always going to keep the same total. Sometimes the totals will change, and it's how was um, the first set of uh, magnets or buttons that she put up different or similar to the one that came next. So there's different variations that you can do with this. You don't always have to use the tem frame, but this more formal activity is working on foundational ideas of number that are so important for young children. Um, and I think that I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to count with kids. Um, and if you are a teacher or someone who's watched kids a lot, you know that counting is actually remarkably complicated. We take counting for granted. We take counting um, that we can just keep going in the, in the number sequence. We've kind of understood how our number system works. But children have to figure that out. It is not something that they know just by counting to 10 that, oh, that just pattern continues when you count to 20 and then 30. And then when you get to 100, what happens after that? Today I was talking with a fifth grader, actually, who um, was counting by 10s up to 100 and then was not sure what number came next. So she said 100. 200 instead of 110. So sometimes we think all they need to know is to figure out how to get to 100, and then after that, they'll just figure it out. But actually, they need those experiences, because when we are counting and counting everything, we learn number names. We learn order. We learn order by ones, by twos, by fives, by tens. We learn it forwards and backwards. We learn the name of a number and what it looks like when you write it symbolically. We learn certainly one-to-one -one correspondence when we're first learning as young children. We learn relative size. So if you have 20 things and you have 100 things, how many 20s does it take to get to 100, right? How many, how many times is 100 bigger than 20? We learn cardinality, which is a very early um, thing to learn about counting, which is when you count a, a set, the number that you end on is the amount that you have. And young children actually have to learn that. It's not something intuitive. So if you see a little kid count, and you say, how, how many are there? And they say, one, two, three, four, five. And then you say, how many are there? They might go back and say, one, two, three, four, five. And how many are there? One, two, three, four, five. So what they're actually thinking you're asking is to do the counting. Not that five, that answer five, is the quantity, right? That's something that little kids learn at a pretty early age, but it still needs to be learned. Um, and of course, and really importantly, we learn how um, our number system is organized into powers of 10 and what that means and how that gives us a lot of power and moving around the number system. Um, so how do we support children's understanding of number in a really rich way? One of the things we have to realize is that kids love stuff. <laughs> they love stuff. So here are a pair of two-year-olds whose names shall remain anonymous, <laughs> who are sitting with their bike helmets on because you, once you get bike helmets, you never take them off. <laughs> and their mom thinks, I just need a few minutes. I'm going to pour a bunch of stuff on your laps, and I'm going to walk away for a little bit. And I think that's going to keep you busy for a little while. And it does. So let's listen in. Oh, here's the pot. 
So when you get stuff, you get very interested in stuff, right? And you want to talk about the stuff, and you want to look for things. And if you've watched the little kids, what else will they want to do with stuff? <laughs> well, they want to throw it, thanks, yeah. But no, they want to touch it, right? These, they're kind of having a conversation. Where's Polly? And oh, look at the puppies in the grass. And oh, I found this one, right? But the other thing that kids do with stuff is they, they start to organize it. That just makes me very happy. <laughs> what are you doing? Um, I'm sorting. Okay. What shapes are you finding? And the, the, um, the pot thing. The what? The pot things. Oh, okay. How many of those do you have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, okay. I don't like the blue ones. How many do you have? So that's the great thing that you can start to do with stuff. You can certainly describe it and be interested in it, talk about the memories that different things bring up, and you can build stuff with it. But you can also start to sort and organize and count. And this is a three or four year old who happened to get a big jar of pot beads and immediately just wanted to play with them over and over and over again, right? And the, the mom sitting there videotaping that is just starts to ask, hmm, what are you doing? How many are there? And you just leave it. And when they're little, really just asking them, how many do you got is all you need to do. And that practice with counting and our standards ask that kids in kindergarten count to 30, they wrote count to 100, but really we should be giving them lots of stuff, much bigger than that, because they can do so much more than that. And as much as we say that young children should have however many hours of lap reading before they get to kindergarten, they should be able to have counted thousands of things before they start formal schooling. Not up to 1,000, but just counting things and being interested in numbers and how big things are. And what's that number that comes after this? Because they need to learn that number sequence and they need to learn and, um, the one-to-one -one correspondence and moving things aside, all that stuff that happens when you learn to count. So one of the things that we do formally with teachers is an activity called counting collections, um, where we take big groups of stuff. Maybe you start with smaller ones, but even big ones that the kids can't completely count, that they can, might be able to count in partners or might be able to count with a, uh, an older buddy who's helping them or a grown-up that's helping them. It becomes intrinsically fascinating to children to touch stuff, to move stuff, to count stuff. So inventorying objects, thinking about um, how many there are without opening a package becomes more challenging too. Counting with a partner, recording that count, which makes you have to start to think about modeling the quantity on paper, an important mathematical practice. And you have to think about methods that you use to count and how would you record that and convey that to someone else. And you're working on all sorts of things that are really, really important. Everything that was on um, the count everything slide a, um, a few slides ago, you get to do by just counting objects and thinking about the interesting kinds of patterns and problems that are generated through that count. So we're going to dive into a, the same kindergarten classroom about the same time of year where in the
quick images activity, they were thinking about how they saw the quantity 8. Now they're thinking about counting a much larger set of objects. And I want us just to pay attention to all of the different cool things that come up in their attempts to do the counting and how the teacher plays a role in pushing and advancing their ideas. So we're going to pop back into Stephanie's classroom. My name is Stephanie Latimer, and today's lesson is counting collections with my kindergartners. They are given a collection and some organizational tools, and they're asked to count whatever is in the collection. And then they are asked to record how they counted and what they counted. So I'm going to give you one thing to think about today before you go count your collections. Are you ready to hear the one thing? Yeah. It's with your recording. So As a teacher, I like being able to just have a short mini lesson that's like, you could try this today. So once you've counted your collection, I want you to think about your recording, Salman. And I'm noticing a lot of people are recording like this. So they're putting 10, 20, 30, and then they have their ones here, and they're saying 31, 32, 33. And that's great. That's a great way to record how you counted. That's how you're saying your count. But I want to ask you something about this. Is there actually 20 things inside this cup? No. Show me on your fingers how many things are actually inside that cup. Yeah. So another way, go ahead and put your hands back in your cookie jar. Another way to show that, and I've noticed a couple people do this before, record like this. They put 10, 10, 10, and then below it, you can tell me how you counted. 10, 20, 30, like that. Can you try that for me today? Yeah. If you would like to? OK. So let's go over counting collections really. So just to kind of orient you to what's happening, this is a class that at the end of last year is about to count collections between 150 and 300 objects. And as kindergartners, they started with collections more like in the 15 range. And at, over time, as the collections have gotten bigger and bigger, they've realized that just counting by ones is going to take them a long time. So they've thought a little bit about how to organize their count. But because they have to record their collection too, they're having to think about how they model symbolically the quantities that they have counted physically. And so the teacher is watching their recordings develop, and she's also trying to help them um, learn and be able to see the number of tens that might be in 100 or in 200. So she's trying to also guide the way that their recordings will develop by asking them to think about putting 10 in a circle and keeping a running tally of their count in, underneath. Okay. So now they're going to get their collections and they're going to count and let's see kind of what comes up for them as they work on a problem that's challenging to them, which is how to count a huge collection of objects. Really quickly, I have a partner. You have to have collections that are at the right level for your kids. We had collections from 150 up to beyond 300. There's little like pom poms from the craft store, marbles, baseball cards, any little thing that you can fit into a Ziploc bag that they can organize, they'll be able to count. You and your partner need to decide how we're going to count. So you might have to play rock, paper, scissors about that. Either by fives or by tens is your choice today. Did I say twos? No. We're just going to do fives or tens today, OK? Sound good? So did you agree on what you're going to count by? Yes. Ma what did you decide? Tens. You're going to count by tens? Learning is constantly happening. No matter what you do, they're, they're going to be learning. Either they're learning how to work with someone else, or they're learning how to write numbers, or they're learning how to count 
you know, rote counter. They're learning how to organize something mathematically. You can count by twos on one plate. You could, oh, to make a 10? Yeah. Tell me what you mean by that. Like, you grab two and you say two, four, two, four, six, So you could count by twos, but make groups of 10. Do you feel comfortable sharing that with the class? So Caleb had a really good idea because, is it because you like counting by twos maybe? Okay, he was saying how you could still count by twos, but make a group of 10. So do you wanna show everyone what you mean by that? Two, four, eight, six. We're, we're surrounded. Eight, ten. ten, yeah. So you see how he counted by twos to make a group of ten? So you could try that if you want to. Now he, she told them to count by fives or tens today because she's trying to work on that with more people in the class because they've done a lot of counting by twos, but of course kids are smarter than we think they are. He still figured out a way to count by twos. But what a nice opportunity to think about how many twos are in ten which then maybe you could continue to generalize. So if there's five twos in 10, how many will there be, how many twos will there be in 20 or 30? Because you figure out how many twos there would be in 100. That question might be too hard, but to know that that's a question that you can ask and that you can chew on is great, right? It's okay to ask questions of kids that they can't quite solve, but to know that that is a mathematical question and that that is really interesting to think about is fabulous. So um, what I like about what she does here is to try to sh help the other kids notice an observation that someone in the class made and then send them back to work. With your group. Go ahead and keep counting. Thanks, Caleb. That's a good idea. What are you guys counting by? B tens. By tens, okay. So you're using plates to put groups of 10 and then you're using a 10 frame. So the 10 frame works because you can put how many things on a 10 frame? Just 10, you don't even have to count. Right, so you don't even have to count it, you just fill it up. So is that what you're using, JT? Okay, so I'm gonna come back once you have your count organized and see how many you have, okay? My expectations are that once they have their count organized and they have recorded their count, then they raise their hand and I come over and we talk about what they did. Okay. So you did what I asked you to try. You put the tens, you told me how many tens, and then you counted up at the bottom. So, so if you were gonna write down right here how many were there, what would you write? So that says 31, but you said 131. So what do you need in the front there? Uh -huh. that, that would just be a one. There you go, so what's your number again? So he's counted up to 131, but he doesn't know how to write the number 131, right? So the learning to write that, the numeral 131 is nicely linked to something. There's a reason why he wants to write 131 because that's how many he counted, and so some very specific direct guidance is what he needs to say this is what 131 looks like. Write down right here, how many were there? What would you write? So he writes 131, and he's working on something slightly different than the next child, which is why this task, the open-endedness of this task is just so fabulous. Okay. Something I was excited to see was a lot of my kids making hundreds because that's kind of the next step that I've been guiding in my conferences. So I want help sticking them together. So like erase this. So making hundreds? Yeah. Is that what you want to do? Make hundreds? Yeah. Okay. JT, are you interested in making hundreds yeah. also? Yeah. So can you put your boards down for a second and we can do this together? So these kids have counted by tens, but they've heard of this magical thing called a hundred. So how do you make a hundred? Once you have a bunch of tens, what does it look like to go from tens to a hundred? So their question is slightly different than Cavell's question, and that's what she's able to help them do. So watch how she does that. So we have 10 here, right? Yeah. yeah. So what if I put these? Now how many do we have? 20. Okay. Eighty, ninety, 
100. So we want to stop there, right? So we know we have 100 there. So Mari, you could just draw this. JT, what if you just circled 100? Do you know what I mean by that? Not sure? Okay, let me tell you what I mean. So we could count up to 100 and then you could just circle it with your pencil. So let's count. One hundred. So we could just stop here, and you could just circle. Can I show you what I mean? Is that okay? So you could just circle this and write what? How many did we just count? And you just write one hundred like that. You guys, that's amazing. Look, you recorded the same thing, but you recorded it very differently. So what you don't exactly see on hers, they've made 100 with the plates, right? So they physically made it, but he had a whole bunch of 10s. So how does he also take the recording that he had and show where the 100 his is? And that's what she helps him to do by not crossing it out and saying, now don't do this, but layering on what they did with the plates in his recording. And then what she's done, which, you, which is not um, legible to you, is she's actually just written a circle with 100 inside. So where is the 10 tens and where is 100? This is a really important idea that we need kids to understand is what's inside 100. And just from their work, and they're not going to learn it just in this one time, but it's going to happen over and over and over again in collections until they really understand what, how 100 is composed. So can you count for me? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 10, 20, 30, 40. I've noticed a lot of students having trouble. If there's 20 cups out there, remembering which ones they've counted. 100, So this says 200. So the other thing that's really fascinating with these cups is you'll notice the the pairs behind as well as this child. She just said 20 cups of 10. You already knew exactly how much that was, right? You do, right? Good. Yeah, good. Good job, everybody. But at, at a very young age, you don't know how to make use of that idea, nor do you know how to make use of the rows of cups that you've made yet. So they get lost kind of systematically going through their rows. Even though they've structured it into a rectangle, you and I might say, well, so if I've got five rows and seven in each row, that's 35 cups, that's, and 10 in each, that's 350, right? But the kids haven't yet figured that out. But over time, that's one of the things that they will be able to do is use, actually use the structure of the array or to think, wait, I'm going to be able to figure this out if I put things into rows of five or rows of 10 in tens then I can really be able to see the structure of our number system and the powers of 10 that are, um, that are so powerful in the way that we um, navigate and use our numbers. But this child is just going to be working on how do I count all my groups of 10 and make sure that I don't double count them. Right? That's what she's going to work on with him. Yet another thing from what other pairs of kids in the class were working on. So when I count, sometimes it helps me to move the ones I've counted so that I know I already counted them. Do you want to try that? Why don't you try that and see if that helps you get to what you recorded. 10, 20, 30. 10, 80, 80, 90. And this one you didn't count. I was watching carefully. 200. So that's exactly what your board says. Another issue that sometimes comes up in recording is writing bigger numbers. Did you have some questions? What are your questions? Um, how much to make 120? How much to make 120? I'm not sure what you're asking me. Are you thinking, what does 120 look like? Oh, so where can we find that in our classroom? The calendar. Not on the calendar. The calendar doesn't go to 120, but we do have another resource. You know what it is? Can I show you? OK, let's go look. So Dariana, come on over here. Where is 120? Ooh, you're pointing to two different things, and they have the same number, so I can see why you're confused. So this. So they've pointed to 102 and 120. 
Very common um, for young kids to do that. What does 120 look like? So the teacher is asking, can see what they think, and then can help them make sense of what does the new rule 120 look like. They have the same number, so I can see why you're confused. So this, we say 101, 102. So that's 102. Dariana, why, why do you think it's here? Right, so we know that this is what? 120. Well, just without the one, it's 20, right? So this is 120. So why don't you go ahead and make sure you have that written on your clipboards, and then you can get a new collection. Honestly, it's one of the days where I'm planning math, and I think, yes, we're counting collections, because it's, it's very independent for them and it's a great way for me to check in with each of my students and kind of see where they are in a lot of different areas. Socially, are they working well together with somebody else? But mathematically, are they reasoning through things? Are they persevering? You know, are they not giving up on themselves? And are they understanding the, the kind of the concepts that, that we've been discussing? should be getting put away. So join me back on the carpet. I wanted to show you guys this count. When I came over, they had it like this already. So I could tell that this was 100. Can you tell that? Yeah. I could tell these were all tens. Can you tell that? Yeah. And I could tell that these are ones. So Courtney, can you count this with me? And I'm going to help you out a little bit. 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, 151, 152, 153. So then I asked Courtney, I said, how many 100s do you have, and what did you say? One. Because it's right here. It's really obvious, right? And I said, how many 10s do you have, and what did you say? Five. Five, uh-huh. And then how many 1s do you have? Three. Three. So 153. Isn't that really easy to see, yeah. the way they recorded yeah. that? Yeah, nice job. You guys give yourself a big silent cheer. You did a super job today counting. All the different ways children celebrate is so fabulous in the classroom. But she ends the counting collections with one particular count that she wants to highlight. And something that's sort of on the horizon for children here to notice the composition of a number like 153. So um, if it later we have a little bit of time, uh, the other clips I brought to share with you is just what pairs of kids that are working together that might have different strengths and ideas bring to just the conversations that they have. What, I've, what we focused on here a lot is the teacher's support in helping kids make strides, but also children as they work together help one another in the kinds of um, advances they need to make in recognizing uh, numerals and knowing how to write them, thinking about the quantities, counting, figuring out um, how to organize and keep track of things. So it's a really beautifully rich activity. And any work that you do formally or informally that involves counting with children can work on all of these different relationships that are so important and foundational for kids' understanding of number. So I'm going to turn it over to Allison, who's going to um, take us away from just counting objects into the context of storybook read-alouds, which is something we do so often with children, and what opportunities there are mathematically in that. So we're coming together tonight as people who really care about supporting um, young children in finding joy in mathematics and feeling like strong mathematicians. So another opportunity for pursuing that is in the world of children's literature. So we're going to make a little turn here and we're going to spend some time thinking about how we could use a really common thing in children's lives. In which is in informal and formal ways, reading books, and how to do that with a mathematical lens so that we can open up opportunities to explore and find wonder in mathematics and find joy in mathematics. So in this next portion, I'm going to share with you a little bit about some ideas about mathematizing. And then we brought books that we're going to pass out, and we're going to do some digging into books together. 
So along with my colleague, Tony Smith, who studies content area literacy, um, and also with some amazing teachers, such as the Lake Ridge teachers that Elham was sharing with us, we've been studying and experimenting mathematizing picture books. And I have a hunch that a lot of you think about picture books in these ways also. So one of the first things we've discovered is nearly any book will do. We've been looking at fictional stories, nonfiction stories, chapter books, and we haven't quite found any books that we haven't been able to find some wonder and joy for mathematics in. The second thing we're finding is that different types of books offer differing opportunities to think about mathematics. So one of the kinds of books we're thinking about are books that I'm sure you've read, and they're books where the mathematics is really prominent. And we're calling these text-dependent books. So in order to understand the book, you really need to spend some time understanding the mathematics that are in them. So an example of a text-dependent book is called Double Those Wheels. And if we were able to read Double Those Wheels together, when we opened it up, we would get to know this little monkey. And what he's doing is he's trying to deliver a pizza to a birthday party. But he keeps running into trouble. And every time he has, hits a snag, he has to switch his mode of transportation. And every time that happens, the wheels double. So let's read the first few pages together. One lone wheel comes wobbling through. Double that wheel, and you've got two. Pant, pant, puff, puff, what a chore. Double those wheels, and you've got four. So you can see that doubling is really central to this story, and you can have some predictions about what would happen in the pages to come. I'd like to ask you to turn and talk to someone next to you. And I want to, I want to ask you to pay attention to a couple things. I want you to think about how does the context of this story and how do the illustrations support children in making sense of the idea of doubling? So find someone next to you that will chat about that. So do people have some ideas you would share about how the context of this story or the illustrations help us think about the mathematical idea of doubling? I noticed in the illustrations that on the second page where it's the unicycle, you see the unicycle one wheel and you see the bicycle two wheels. Mm. And then you go to the next page and you just see the two wheels. Mm. And you go back here and you see the two wheels from the bike and you see the four wheels from the car in the same picture. And then you just see the four wheels in the car in the next picture. Never noticed that in oh. this book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What else? What else are people noticing? I noticed that the, at the top of each page are the wheels so that they're in order, so you're not having to necessarily count on the picture, especially in the four. It's a little hard to see all four on the car, but the four are up top. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. What else? Um, to extend that, you can use the four on the tops, the same number that are on the vehicle. So you can you know that when you're doubling, you're adding the same number on top of it. So you can say four, five, six, seven, eight, and make a prediction of what's going to come next. Oh, I've never thought of that either. <laughs> <laughs> can I share with you one funny thing that children noticed on this fours page? Do you see that there's four flowers? Did anyone notice? Did you notice that? Yeah. Do you see on top of the pizza box there's three steam puffs coming up? Yeah. So one of the students says, well, the drawer forgot to put the fourth piece of steam coming up, which had me thinking about the relevance of illustrators in making books mathematically rich. Yeah. So. You may pull a different type of book off of your shelf. It may not be a book that's as, de the mathematics is not as dependent in the story, but that it offers opportunities to deepen students' understanding by highlighting the mathematical ideas. So a book that we've all read, and a book I saw on Ms. Latimer's bookshelf when we were watching the video, is The Very Hungry Caterpillar. 
And so if we were reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar together, understanding the story of this caterpillar's week-long eating adventure doesn't require thinking mathematically. But if we did spend some time keeping track of how many things he ate, it's a really nice opportunity to practice counting and discussing strategies for recording and organizing information and writing and solving equations. So I want to imagine that we're walking into a classroom together. There's a first grade teacher at Lake Ridge Elementary School that has really taken to reading books with a mathematical lens. And I love to go in and visit her and just listen to the ways that she and her students talk about stories. So one afternoon I walked into her classroom and they were just finishing reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar. And the sea of first graders were at her feet and they all had a clipboard for keeping track of how many things this caterpillar ate along the way. And as I knelt down, they had just finished reading the story. And this is what I heard. The teacher, Miss Mack, she says, so how many things did the very hungry caterpillar eat? And we hear students say, 26, 25. And she says, well, it sounds like we have different answers. Let's share some of the ways you kept track and see if we can agree. Eva, I see you, you use tally marks. Can you tell us what you did and why? And Eva said, well, every time he ate another food, I made a little mark in his belly. And at the end of the story, I went back and counted up all the marks. I did it like this because I could just make a little line each time he ate something, and that helped me keep track because he ate a lot. And that's Eva's work down there in the bottom. So as the conversation continued, different students shared the different ways that they recorded. And Eva's classmate, Isaiah, what he did was he wrote the day of the week, because you remember that in The Very Hungry Caterpillar, on Monday, he eats one apple. And on Tuesday, he eats two pears and so forth. So Isaiah wrote the day of the week, and then he made a little dot for how many things were eaten that day, and then he went back and counted them all up. Whereas their classmate Halima, she just counted on. So every time another item was eaten, she added another number on there. So I've spent some time thinking about just this even little small segment of transcript, and I've been in wonder at how much there is to notice about the mathematical thinking that's happening here. So to point out a few things, these students are engaged in sense-making discussion. They're listening in order to agree or attempt to come to consensus, because they have two different answers out on the table. In their recording, they're really attending to precision. So you remember the mathematical practices that Elham showed us in the beginning? So the way that these children are trying to use strategies to include each object only once without losing track is helping them try to be precise. They're also considering different representations and different solutions, both their own and their classmates as they discuss them in order to make sense of the problem and persevere in solving it and try to come to agreement about if there's 26 or 25 things. The other thing I think is interesting to notice here is the way that Eva says at the end, because he ate a lot. What that told me was spending a little time thinking about the story mathematically also enhanced the way she was comprehending or making sense of the story as a literacy experience. So there are also ways that we can think about mathematizing when we're in a nonfiction book. And I want to drop into a nonfiction book for a moment to hear what that sounds like. So this book is called Cactus Hotel, and it's a book that Elham found in anticipation of a family visit to Arizona. Do you remember this book, Niku? No. no. <laughs> it's been a little while. So what happens in this story um, if we got to read it together, is we would learn that the fruit of the saguaro cactus has 2,000 black seeds. So we would definitely pause to marvel at that number, 2,000. Just thinking back to our snap peas inside and how many there were there, and thinking about opening up a fruit and seeing 2,000. 
we might ask students, do you know how to write 2,000? As we read on, we'd also learn that after 10 years, this cactus is only four inches high. And we might say, wow, 10 years old? Our friend Khalil is 10 years old, and Khalil is this tall. How big is four inches? Can you show me using your fingers? And then as we read on, we would find out that after 60 years, the cactus is 18 feet tall. Wow, how tall is that? Can you imagine if Khalil was 18 feet tall when he was 60? And what do we know that's 18 feet tall? And what would it look like if we measured 18 feet along the ground? And how many Khalils would it take to make up 18 feet? And we might end by saying, let's look back at these cactuses in the book and see if we can make a prediction about how old the cactuses are. So it is interesting to think about mathematizing in nonfiction books. One of the things I'm thinking about is that they can often be somewhat more apparent in the ways you can mathematize because they often contain numerically based facts like 2,000 seeds or 4 inches or 18 feet. So there's one other type of book that you might pull off your shelf and find some interesting ways to find wonder and joy for mathematics. And these are times when you're reading along and it really doesn't matter to the story, but you notice something interesting in a picture or an illustration and you just want to pause for a moment and notice that. So you think of the snowy day and we all remember this story. And you might pause to notice the footprints and say, Let's count the footprints. How could we count them? And we notice something in this situation. In this context, we could count the footprints in twos. And then we might jump outside the, con outside the context and think about abstractions. What numbers can you reach when you count by twos? What numbers will you never reach if you count by twos? So in this example, students are working on counting but they're also working on reasoning abstractly, and we're weaving together mathematical content and the practices. Do you remember the Madeline series? Yeah, where these girls are often in rows. And here are those same girls in a piazza. This is Madeline um, and the cats of Rome. So I wanted to ask you to take a moment and chat with someone next to you I want you to count the girls in both pictures, and then I want you to talk about your experience for a moment counting them in these two different pictures. So I get this fabulous view from down here, and I get to see what you're doing. And I just want to show you some of what I see. In the first picture, I'm seeing a lot of people going like this. And then in the second picture, moving all around. So it's interesting to notice in this story how we can make use of structure to help us figure out how many girls there are. There's another series of books where you might just want to linger and do some thinking about the pictures. Do you know Mo Willems' books about elephant and piggy? So these are books that ch children just love. And the funniest things happen to Elephant and Piggy. And in this story called There's a Bird on Your Head, <laughs> Piggy thinks it's really funny that a family of birdies takes up residence on Elephant's head. And Elephant is really not happy about this at all, as you can see in his expression. But what's so interesting to notice when we just pause for a moment is that this family of birdies really lends itself to scene five is made up of two and three. Whereas if we stopped in put me in the zoo and spent a moment to think about this creature that's balancing balls on his nose, children might see the five in a variety of different ways. They might see one, two, three, four, five. They might see one and four or four and one. They might see two and three or three and two. And we could celebrate that there's many different ways to make five. Or if you are reading a nonfiction book about jungles, you might pause at this picture of the chameleon 
to talk together and make wonder about the ways that a chameleon uses patterns and shapes and changing colors to disguise themselves in nature. So we've briefly considered what it would sound like to use a few fictional or non-fictional books with a mathematical eye. And we've brought some stacks of children's books representing this range that we've been discussing. And we want to pass them out to you. And you can take one for you and your neighbor if you'd like to talk about it together. And we want to invite you to thumb through the story and approach the story as if you have mathematical glasses on, you're mathematical detectives, and you're reading this story for finding wonder and joy of mathematics. And after you've had a few moments to explore, we're going to ask some people to share what you're noticing. So we know that you could spend much more time pouring through these books with your mathematical glasses on. But we're just going to pause here for a moment to see if anyone would just share something initial that's coming up for you as you mathematize your book. Please. <laughs> so we had Move Over Rover. And um, initially, I thought, OK, just basically like, OK, how many leaves or how many flowers? And as we were flipping, somebody left a very nice note in here that oh. says, <laughs> Yeah, keep track of how many animals, animals you see in the book. So I think it was just a good lesson to me that this is a learning tool for myself, you know, to really start thinking of yeah. thinking that way. Yes. So thank you. That's funny. There's a sticky note. Is it a sticky note? Yes. So, so one of the things teachers have taught me about this is it's handy to put a sticky note on a page where you might just linger and ask something. So a teacher might, or a parent might, grab a book off the shelf, give a quick thumb through, notice places where you think you might ask mathematical questions or wonder about mathematics, and you put a little sticky note to themselves in that spot. Move over, Rover is a really interesting story. Um, this dog, Rover, he's in the doghouse, and then all these animals keep coming in. So then there's, you know, a skunk comes and joins him, and a bird and a snake. Well, no, I think the skunk comes later, because as soon as the skunk comes, they all run out. So you can keep track of the, adi the adding in of the animals, and then the animals run out. So we have a, a special teacher here tonight who's been spending a little time thinking about reading stories with a mathematical lens. And I'm so hopeful to learn from her. And, and Katie, I was wondering if you would just say just any initial ideas about what it's been like for you with your students to be reading books in these ways. We just learned about this a couple of weeks ago, and I was really excited because we do read alouds all the time, but thinking about doing it mathematically just kind of changes it up a little bit. And we need something to be changed up right now because it's the end of the year, and we need to just need to do things differently. Um, so we've actually taken some of our very favorite books that we have read over and over again. One of them is uh, My Little Sister Ate One Hair, and it's a pretty funny book about this little girl who eats all of these things. And at the very end, she, I mean, she eats really gross things, like <laughs> all these different animals and stuff. And then at the end, she's, she has to eat 10 peas. And then she actually throws up. And so they love this book because she throws up all of these animals at the end <laughs> of the book. And, you know, I, we, so I teach kindergarten this year, but I had these kids in pre-K. And so we started reading this book in pre-K. I mean, we read it at least 100 times. <laughs> and um, they constantly go back to it. But just last week, I said, you know, what if we thought about how many things she actually ate? And how could we do that? And so I gave them all blank pieces of paper, and they got right to work. They, it was amazing to watch how many different ways kids were recording. They were drawing pictures. And we do counting collections all the time, too. So they, they're kind of in that mode of recording their ideas. Um, but it was inter interesting because one student started doing it where she um, started writing numbers consecutively mm -hmm. and she got to the point where she just couldn't do it anymore yeah. and she just kind of looked up at me and I could tell she was just like oh, I can't do this anymore I think we were probably on you know n the number six yeah. and I I looked over at her and we also do high scope so it's kind of like a problem solving you know like what can you do right now immediately 
I'm just going to start drawing pictures. And so she was able to kind of make that leap to go, oh, I'm going to solve this problem by now mm -hmm. going into continuing on. And so she just kind of picked right up. And I, for me, it was like, oh, thank goodness, because I didn't want to squelch anything right there. But it's it's been pretty amazing. So today we did a very um, simple book. We did The Little Lady Who Swallowed a Fly, which was nothing to them now because they had done this other book. It, it's it's amazing to watch them do this because we're thinking so differently about these books and there's just so much excitement about it. But it also makes me think we do readers workshops, so, you know, and we do low, the kids use post-it notes in their own books, so I think, can I put some little books out for them that are their level now and have them go for it mm. and think, how can I think mathematically about my own little book? And I think they can. I haven't tried it yet, but um, because we've done, so, I've done so much modeling with them, and they're just they're right there, and they're really excited mm -hmm. about it. So, it's been really fun. Oh, that's beautiful. To, to do Thank this. you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's reminded me of a student I was with recently who who is in a similar setting and has had a lot of experiences with his teacher reading books with mathematical glasses on, and uh, he said, "We're math detectives." when we read. Yeah. So thank you for that. So I think we're coming to a, a culmination. Ilham, do you want to say anything? <laughs> no, do the kids. What's that? You got to get it. I got to get it. <laughs> Quick, fast. I did it. <laughs> well, <laughs> We're back to where we started from, and we hope that um, over this last bit of time with us, you are seeing mathematics in new ways, you're seeing it more colorfully, and appreciating all that is mathematical work, predicting, generalizing, reasoning, modeling, strategizing. We hope that you will take that to your work with young children wherever you are. So go forth and mathematize. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, um, I loved your talk, it's Thanks. awesome. I love the hands-on part, of course. Um, I just had one, not kind of question, but comment. Um, just with working with English language learners, mm. how what are the strategies that you would use, especially for the mathematizing reading and mm. um, some of those problems where you would have a language barrier? Mm. Actually, we have found that the way to learn language is to produce it, mm -hmm. right? To talk, to have to talk, to point to think of the words for what you're trying to say. So we have found that being in a rich talking environment is actually super helpful for people who are learning language, um, English in our case, but also that to be able to code switch and to be able to, um, sometimes you can represent your ideas on paper because you can draw, because you can count. So through gesture, the fact that there are um, actual objects that are being counted and moved, um, and the words that go along with that, the number words that go, and being able to code switch between the, a language that you um, are more familiar with and then recount and try to do it in English together with someone else, we've actually found that um, it's been really, really helpful for students who are um, emerging bilinguals, emerging trilinguals. And um, we also use pair share talk a lot in classrooms, which allows people to try out something first before they share. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the partner work um, reinforces and helps kids produce language, which is the way to learn. My question is, teachers have benefited from this talk, those who have attended. Um, how do we encourage parents to also benefit from this lens, and how can they also be a mm -hmm. part of this, teach at home with this added lens of reading books or coupling or um, sorting objects. How do we as teachers kind of also provide that resource for parents to look at books from a different way? Hmm. Such an important question. Um, I'll try, I'll, and you can add on. Um, one of the things I really think about when I get the chance to be with parents um, is helping them to recognize how mathematically rich their lives are. And um, it's not that 
seldom that someone will, s I will hear a parent say that I'm not a math, I'm not a math person. Um, and so uh, it always baffles me a little bit because of the richness of mathematics in our world and in our lives and where it is all around us. So I think that um, in any capacity we can, helping people see the mathematics in our world and in our lives is a really nice starting place. Um, what, would you, what would you add on to that? Well, we have um, at the schools where we've been working, mm -hmm. backpacks that go home. Yeah. I mean, to send home a, a, a book with a sticky note yeah. on it gives great suggestions yeah. for parents. Yeah. Um, any kind of um, handouts or notes home that help yeah. um, reinforce for parents, give them ideas. And actually, I don't think kid, the parents have to do very many formal things at home. They yeah. need to play games. Yeah. There's so much mathematics in games. Um, yeah. And to count, count everything, count all the time. Um, is the kind of advice that I would actually give to families. There isn't a whole lot more than that that you need to do, especially with young children, um, but just to be interested in that and counting things and, and following your child's lead, mm -hmm. actually, because the kids will take you mm -hmm. um, places. So I think it's sort of that attitude, that enthusiasm, because it's not mm -hmm. about formal formalisms, mm -hmm. actually, and flashcards and things that, ki that parents need to be doing at home. It's more counting and playing games. All, and so um, sometimes we send home backpacks of mm. a simple card game, a simple board game, um, books with suggestions of things to do. And also, uh, kids can take things home, right, and say, I'm going to teach you a game mm -hmm. that I learned at school. Let's play it together with your cousins, with your family members, with yeah. your siblings, with your uncle, with your grandma, whoever it may be. Um, yeah. And I think that's a great way to support kids. Mm -hmm. At home, I, I say that. Do you have a follow-up? Oh yeah, please. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, you, you mentioned uh, flashcards, yeah. and it is my experience that I was a preschool teacher myself, and that's my fallback was flashcards. That's what I thought would be the best way, seeing yeah. the number and the sequence, and its placement. However, if I have not have been present for this talk, I wouldn't have realized that that was probably not the best take. Um, so how do you take this and kind of bring it to other teachers? Mm -hmm. So I know some of these school districts that you have been working with have your guidance. So how do you take this knowledge and bringing at, bring it out to other teachers that would benefit from this? Mm -hmm. Sorry, thank you. Can they access the video? They can access the video. <laughs> I would say oh, yeah. share the video. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say one thing about you as um, earlier about the parents. I really want to make sure when I'm saying that it doesn't sound like I'm seeing that as a deficit in parents. Um, but I think that when we might not just see the world with mathematical idea eyes, it's just that our life hasn't provided us opportunities to do that yet. So through children being able to do that and share that with their parents and find joy and wonder in mathematics through everyday experiences can broaden that for for adults who, who may not have experienced that in their formal or informal. Well, thank you thank for participating you. with us today. Thanks. Thanks.